Turn on yours. How are we doing today? How are we doing this morning? Do you guys do you guys like the rain or do you guys not? No. See, I used to love the rain, and now I'm kind of meh. It's just like when it's three days in a row, it's just it's too much. Yeah, I just like and the sun's finally coming out. It feels good, the warmth of the sun. So as Shar just said, we are in a brand new series. It's called Encounters, and um, we're just going to be going through this series. You're going to hear from uh, multiple different speakers this weekend. Hayden's gone. He's up in uh, he's up at a camp with his old ministry. Um, so would you guys be praying? I think they're coming back today. So be praying for them and for safety and travels. But, um, I get the honor of opening the first weekend in this series. And so this whole series is just going to be going through what people's encounters were like physically with Jesus. So people who had conversations with him, people who met him, and we're just going to be kind of breaking those down to just like bite-sized pieces to help you guys and say, what is Jesus actually trying to say here? What is, what is the context? What's the meaning of this? And what does this mean for me? Um, and just look at the heart of Jesus, look at the heart of God and make it easier for you guys, hopefully to just sit with Jesus and just be with Jesus and just follow him. So today I love this story that we're going to be reading and I think it's so good and it's just so infused I was gonna say infatuated but I didn't want to like use a big word infused with just Jesus's character in the gospel and it's John 3 it's um our good friend and if you don't know him I'll introduce you to him Nicodemus and it's Nicodemus and Jesus and they're having this conversation so if you guys want to open up to John 3 if you don't have a bible or some bibles on that back table you're gonna want one um if you sit in church and you're bored, it's probably because you're not following along. You don't have a Bible with you. Um, so grab a Bible. If you guys want paper, Shark could grab you some. Um, take notes. But yeah, we're in John 3.1. And my hope today is that we just simplify the gospel. We simplify what it means to follow Jesus and what it means, the gospel, and what that means for us. And how do we walk out this faith? through today and how do we sit with Jesus? Are you guys there? John 3? John 3, 1? All there? We good? All right, before we get started, I'm, oh, well, hold on. Before we get started, I'm going to pray for us and just invite the Spirit to work through us. So, Father, just thank you for your word. We thank you for your truths and that it doesn't return void to us, Lord. God, I pray that your Spirit would go through this message today and my teachings today, and may my words be honoring in thy sight, Lord, that anything that is not of you would be erased from the brains of everyone in here and the minds of everyone in here. God, we just pray for your spirit to show up, and we are expectant, Lord. We love you and pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, John 3. John 3. It starts like this. Now there was a Pharisee a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Verse four, how can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb. Verse five, Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. You should not be surprised at my sayings. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is for, with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher said Jesus, and you do not know these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? Verse 13, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who has come from heaven, the son of man. Verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And probably the most famous Bible verse of all time, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, 
but to save the world through him. If you're anything like me, I read this for the first time and I was a lot like good old Nick. I was like, birth? How, what? Like, what is rebirth? What does this mean? And I think to understand this passage and what Jesus is trying to tell Nicodemus, we need to understand the context. So first, let's talk about Nick. Good old Nicodemus, Nick at night. Who, what is a Pharisee? Can anyone tell me? Teachers of the law. They knew the law like the back of their hand. They would preach it. They lived by it. They breathed it. But Nicodemus just isn't any Pharisee. What did it say in verse, I think it's two. Oh, sorry, the end of verse one. He was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Does anyone know what the other name besides Brody and anyone who's at 910 plus last night, what the other name for the Jewish ruling council is? The Sanhedrin. Nicodemus just isn't any Pharisee. He knows the law. He breathes the law. He teaches the law. But he's also part of the Sanhedrin. That's your government. That's your courts. That's your judges. That's like if the president walked into the back of this room and was just like, oh, hey, guys. Hello, fellow Americans. Right? Nicodemus just isn't any Pharisee. He's a high government official. He's a high teacher, high priest. And what's interesting to me is why Nicodemus chose to meet him at night. Why did Nicodemus choose to meet him at night? This man, Nick, could have just walked around anywhere and been welcomed anywhere. He could have walked through the city streets and people probably would have gotten out of the way for him. He was treated as a celebrity, as like royalty. So why is this man of such high stature meeting with Jesus at night? Why would you meet with someone at night? So no one can see you. you. At night, there's no sun. There's no light. This is back in first century. There's no electricity. All you have is the moon and the stars. At night, no one can see you. I think that makes it all the more interesting. We see more about Nick in that. It's like he was curious. He was a man of high stature. And if you know the story between the Pharisees and the dynamic between the Pharisees and Jesus, they were constantly opposing each other. The the pharisaical law and all that opposed most of Jesus' teaching. And Jesus' teachings opposed most of the laws or how the Pharisees understood the law. And so a man of this stature of the Sanhedrin, your government, the man of your courts, the man who knew the law back and forth, like it was nothing, is meeting with someone who opposes everything they stand for at night. So I think we see Nick is questioning some things. And his first thing he says is, Rabbi, We know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one can perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. He doesn't even ask a question. He's just getting started. And Jesus just like interrupts him. He's like, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And Nick just takes a step back and he's like, huh? What do you mean born again? And says what we're probably all thinking. Surely I can't crawl back into my mother's womb and be born again. He doesn't even ask a question. Jesus just hits him with truth off the bat. And Nick responds in verse four with confusion. So I think we see three stages of how Jesus moves towards Nick. And I think if you want to write this down, we see Jesus's character so much throughout this conversation of answer, truth. Nick responds with confusion, truth. Nick responds with confusion. And then finally, Jesus puts it in terms that he would understand. He meets him where he's at. Jesus meets Nicodemus where he's at. And so then in verse five, he goes into a more detailed description and references the wind. And in verse nine, Nick's still like, what? How can this be? And then in verse 10, Jesus hits him with a, you're the teacher of Israel referencing his high authority and who he is, you should know this. 
And then Jesus goes on to explain, I've talked to you about earthly things, but if you do not understand earthly things, then how are you supposed to understand what I'm about? If you do not understand this, you don't understand my entire message, who I am. And then in verse 13, understanding the context, I bet Nick's world was just rocked. In John 3, 13, no one has ever gone into heaven except the son of man who came from heaven. And if you know your Bible, you know the son of man refers to Jesus. He would often refer to himself as the son of man. And that comes from a prophecy somewhere in Daniel. I think it's Daniel 7. Um, he is the son of man. He will be lifted up. And this must have just rocked his world. Because if you know more about the Jewish faith and more of context, is back in first century, if you were a Jew, you believed that you already had a spot in heaven because of your lineage, because of your, related, your relation to Abraham. Because you were a descendant of Abraham, you believed that you already had a spot in heaven that a spot was reserved for you in heaven. And Jesus just comes and wrecks that whole theory for him. No one has ever gone to heaven except through the son of man who came from heaven. And Nick's probably sitting here like, Whoa. Nick would teach this. Nick believed this with his heart that he had a spot in heaven already because of what he did, who he was, where he was born and who he was related to, who his great granddaddy was. He believed he had a spot in heaven. And Jesus just comes along and says, no. Very truly, I tell you, no one has gone to heaven except for the son of man who came from heaven. And so we see throughout this conversation, Jesus gives truth. Nicodemus is confused. Jesus gives a more explained definition of that truth. Nicodemus is still confused. And then Jesus meets him where he's at and he just gives him hard truth, hard loving truth. And then gives him in terms that he would know. You see, he, he picks a story about Moses. And since Nick was a Pharisee and he was the teacher of Israel, he would know this story. He would know it by heart. It's probably one of his favorite stories. He says in verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And if you don't know this story, it's in Numbers 21, if you want to write that down and read it later. It's a crazy story. If you think your Bible's boring, it's because you haven't read it. The Old Testament is freaking wild. Here, listen to this story. In Numbers 21, the people of Israel were going against God. They had idols. They were worshiping other gods. And so God sees this and he displays his wrath. And when God does, he sends down venomous snakes. And the venomous snakes bite the people of Israel. And the people of Israel become sick. And so God tells Moses, lift this bronze snake. And whoever looks at it and believes will be saved. All that it took for the people of Israel to be saved was to look and to believe. And the story will go on and say that some people didn't look because they didn't believe that something like that could exist. And so they died. But the people who looked and believed were saved. And so Jesus uses this story to present him the gospel. Just as that snake was risen and people, all they had to do was look and to believe, the son of man will be lifted up and all you have to do is look and to believe, to have eternal life. Friends, this is the simple gospel. Nick's world was just shattered. Nick is probably sitting here like, what? This is not what I was taught. This is not what I'm teaching. Because of who I am, because of my stature in society, because of what I've done, I have a spot in heaven. And Jesus comes along and says, no. It's nothing about what you've done. It's nothing about who you are, where you've been born. And it's all about me. The gospel is all about Jesus. Just as that snake is lifted up, all you have to do 
is look and believe. In Romans 10, 9, it lays out salvation perfectly. And like I said in the beginning of this sermon, I love this story because it's so reflective of who Jesus is and it just gives you the gospel. In Romans 10, 9, you guys can write this down, read this later if you want. Romans 10, 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. you will be saved. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead because there is no gospel without no resurrection. If you believe in your heart, Jesus raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is salvation, clear, cut, simple. That is the gospel. And then in verse 16, for God so loved the world For God so loved the world. You see, friends, the gospel is simple. It is a message of freedom and victory. That there is nothing you can do. For God so loved the world. That's just basically saying God moved. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God moved. It doesn't say for God saw humanity was doing better and then he sent his son. It doesn't say for God said, well, if they do a little bit better, if they stop sitting here, if they stop doing that, if they stop watching porn, if they stop making out with their girlfriend, if they stop having sex, then I'll send my son. It doesn't say for God said, if they stop drinking, if they stop doing drugs, if they stop cheating, lying, stealing, then I'll send my son. No, it says for God so loved the world. While we were still enemies of the cross, God sent his son and said, I love you and I want to be with you. Friends, this is a message of victory and freedom. It's a message not based on me. The Bible is not a story of how I got to God, but how God got to me, how God got to you. Friends, the gospel isn't dependent on our faith. It's not dependent on who we are, what we've done, what we think. For God so loves the world. There's no caveats. There's no if and but. It's for God so loved the world. There's nothing you can do to gain your salvation. So then why do we still beat ourselves up when we walk away for a little bit? There is nothing you can do to earn your salvation. So why do I still try to gain his, his appeal, his, his attention? Why do I still try to appease him like I haven't been already saved, like he doesn't already view me as his son? You see, friends, when I'm burnt, when I'm tired, when I don't want to open my Bible, when I don't want to pray, when I don't want to come to church, I beat myself up so much because I'm like, I should want to do these things, but I don't. God, when I'm so burnt and I have nothing to give, the hardest thing for me to do is to open your word and say, you are good. And then after that comes the shame, comes the guilt that I'm not a good Christian and I don't deserve this. And so if I'm feeling this way, then that must be the truth. But what I forget and what we forget is that the gospel's not about us. It's not about what we did. We just saw that. All the people of Israel had to do was to look at the snake and believe. All Romans 10 says you have to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. No if, and, or but. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I believe God meets me in that when I'm burnt, when I have nothing to give, when I'm tired, when I'm weary, when I'm angry, when I'm frustrated. And God meets me in that and he says, child, this was never about you. You may feel this way, but I don't. So I'll sit here and I'll wait. So I'll sit here and I'll walk through the fire with you. I'll walk through the hardship. I'll walk through the hurt. I'll walk through the pain. It doesn't scare me. I've felt way worse. 
your faith and your salvation is not dependent on what you've done. If you've read your Bible this week, if you've prayed this week, friends, this should be freeing that I've already earned salvation. There's nothing I can do. Jesus doesn't see you when you wake up in the morning and said, oh, she didn't read her Bible. That's one tick on the challenge. That's a move down. You guys remember the charts in elementary school where it was like your mood and like you move the clip down if you're doing bad. You remember that? A little scary, huh? God's not up there in heaven like, oh, got to move his clip down. He didn't read his Bible. He didn't check his box. Because when God sees you, he sees his son. He sees perfection. He sees glory. He sees holiness. So it doesn't matter when you fail to read your Bible. Don't beat yourself up about it. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't read your Bible. I'm not saying it's bad to pray. I'm not saying it's bad to come to church. I'm not saying don't do that. You don't have to. You see, God gave us these things. God gave us prayer to be in communion with him. God gave us his word so that we could learn more about him. And that his word would be breathing and active on our hearts and meditating on our hearts and change our lives. But you see, friends, the enemy's biggest deception is to make you feel shame for that when you should feel conviction. You see, friends, conviction always should bring us back to Jesus. But when we feel condemnation, which just means punishment, when we feel that we should be punished for not reading our Bible, then that's when we isolate. Then that's when we don't tell the truth. Then that's when we think differently of God. When God didn't give you these things to feel condemnation. It doesn't say in Romans, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and breathe in your heart that he raised him from the dead and then read your Bible twice a week and then pray twice a week, pray every morning, pray after every meal. It doesn't say that. Sometimes I wonder if we started these checkboxes that were supposed to be about Jesus, it's supposed to bring us closer to Jesus. And I wonder if we've taken the checklist over Jesus and we've forgotten the whole point. You see, friends, I, we are a new creation if you're in Jesus. The Bible says you're a new creation. I think it's somewhere in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Someone check me on that later. 2 Corinthians 5. You're a new creation in Christ. You have the ministry of reconciliation. You're a new creation. God doesn't see the old sinner. God sees righteousness. God sees glory. Friends, God's heart is not punishment and condemnation. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And God did not send him into the world, condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's scripture. That's truth. So friends, it's okay to be tired. I guarantee 90% of you are gonna go throughout this week and not open your Bible, not think about God and not act like a child of God should. I know it, I've lived it. I've been a ninth and 10th grader before. I do that at 19 and my job is at a church. This is my job. This is what I do. I talk about Jesus and I disciple ninth and 10th grade students. And there's times I don't want to open my Bible when I'm so tired and I have nothing to give. Remember friends, Jesus isn't sitting up in heaven, moving your clip down the chart. Jesus is sitting up in heaven and saying, my son, you've forgotten the gospel is not about you. You see friends, when we keep following Jesus and we keep walking with Jesus, it is an outpour of his spirit that leads us to want to read. It is an outpour of his spirit that leads us to prayer, that leads us to the fruits. It's not our own labor. And thank God, because I'm tired and I'm weary. And I don't know if I could do this myself. I can't pull myself up the mountain. It takes the same humility that brought me to the cross of Jesus that will continue to help me follow Jesus. The same humility that brought me to Jesus in the first place, the same understanding of my sin, the same understanding that I'm a sinner and I need grace and I need mercy, that is the same humility we need if we wanna be transformed by Jesus. 
friends, your walk is not going to be picture perfect. Nicodemus would have been looked as the picture perfect Jewish in the faith. He would have been looked as the picture perfect person and he doesn't even get it. He did all the things. He did all the religious things. He checked all the boxes and he still doesn't get salvation because what if your religion is getting in the way of you following Jesus? What if your checkboxes are actually blocking you for what the checkboxes are actually supposed to be about? Friends, start operating from victory and as a child of God. And when you get burnt and when you get tired and when you don't want to pick up your Bible, don't let the enemy shame you into isolation. Instead, run to the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I'm tired. Lord, I don't get it. I don't want to read your word this week. I don't want to spend time. Lord, it's even hard to pray right now. And let Jesus comfort you and meet you in that. Let Jesus comfort you and meet you in your brokenness. And when God answers his prayer, your prayers, because God answers prayers, praise him and rejoice for the Lord is near. Your God has not left you. There's just three things I want to end with today and I want to leave you with. Three things I believe we get from this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Number one is this, if you're writing notes. Don't hold on tight to religion because it could keep you from Jesus. Friends, we all know those, we all have those friends at school that say they're Christian, but they don't know Jesus. That say they're Christian, but they don't act like it. Friends, it's because this following Jesus is not just a checklist. It's not, okay, I made it to an 11 a.m. service this week. I'm good for the rest of the week. Okay, I'm going to make it to life group so I can check out that box for the month. Okay, I read my Bible for 15 minutes. I prayed today. When a relationship with Jesus is so much more when we understand we're made new, we're created new. It's not, I got to check out this box. I got to make it to church. But the outpour of the spirit is what makes us want to go to church. The outpour of the spirit in my life is what makes me want to do this job. Is because Jesus met me when I was 15, 16 year old, when I lived my whole life, not knowing who God was, not growing up in a Christian home. And Jesus met me at your age and changed my life, transformed my life, made new my life. And it's the outpour of that Jesus that makes me want to get up here and teach and tell you about him. It's that outpour of Jesus that makes me want to study his word. And number two is this. You can't earn your salvation, so stop trying to earn his approval. If the gospel is not about us and we can't earn our salvation, then why do you think you can earn his approval by checking off your Christian boxes? If you can't earn your salvation, you're not going to earn his approval through checking off a box. Friends, we have to operate from victory and from mercy and from grace because that's what's been given to us. And so instead of stop trying so hard to check off all these boxes, maybe we just need to start receiving more, receiving the grace and receiving the mercy. Your God doesn't look at you with disappointment when you don't read your Bible. Your God gave you his word to help you as a tool, as a resource, not to condemn you. Not to say, wow, you didn't do that this week. Not to give you homework. Not to give you another project. Not to give you another thing to do. But as a tool and a resource to help to get him know, to get to know him better. And number three is this. The gospel is simple, but it's hard to live out. The gospel is simple, but it's difficult to live out. Friends, the gospel is simple. It says in Romans 10, 9. The Bible is a whole story about how 
we did nothing to get to God, but how God did everything to get to us. It's simple, but it's so hard to operate from that. Friends, I'll say this till I'm blue in the face because I need this reminder every day. The mark of a Christian isn't perfection, but it's repentance. The mark of a Christian isn't perfection, it's repentance. If you weren't perfect while Christ died for you, why do you think you have to be perfect now? If you weren't perfect while Jesus marched to the cross, why would you have to be perfect now? Friends, following Jesus isn't a checklist. It isn't another thing to do. It isn't another book to read. It's a relationship. It ebbs and flows. It's dynamic. It's not just straight up. There's going to be seasons where you don't want to read your Bible. It's going to be seasons where it's hard to pray. But I challenge you and I push you. Those seasons is where you want to pray more and ask God what's going on. God, I don't get why everything's so hard right now. I don't get why I'm so fresh. I don't get this. I don't get this. I don't feel you. I don't feel, I don't feel you near God. But I want to feel you, God. Please just give me an inch. Please help me. I don't get it. And I believe those honest prayers is where God meets us the most. Let God meet you where you're burnt, where you're tired. That's not another checklist. That's not another checkbox. And start following Jesus more and start thinking about the checklist less. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that the gospel is not dependent on me. The gospel is not dependent on us. So Lord, that's a gospel that fails continuously every day. Lord, I thank you that your mercies are new every morning and your grace is sufficient. God, may we live from that. May we live from that space. May the meditation of your word outpour from my heart and may you transform my life, God. God, this gospel is never about me, Lord, but it's all about you and everything you did to get to us. Father, I thank you for these students. Would your spirit go before them this week? God, I pray that anything that was not of your word today, anything that was not of your spirit would be erased from the minds of these people and that your truth would supersede all lies, God. Father, we love you and we praise you.